Today's video is sponsored by Ridge for their compact, durable wallets designed to help streamline what you carry around. Stay tuned for later in the video to learn more and check out the link in the description below. Hey everyone, what's up? It's been a minute, but I'm back and uh, we got a lot of Diablo 4 news. There's actually been a ton of updates over these past several days. Uh, Blizzard appears to be going through a bit of a marketing push right now, doing interviews with gaming news websites, what few of those remain, releasing some of their own video and written content, as well as giving select content creators some exclusive early access which is cool to see. Yeah, we just got a ton of new news and information and what I've done here is consolidated, wrapped it all up and hope to put a nice little bow on top of it for you. And uh, yeah, let that just sit back, relax, and let's get right into it. Starting off with Riker, he released a fairly in-depth video detailing Diablo 4's end game after going hands-on with an early build, making him, with the exception of the developers themselves, the only person on the planet who can actually talk about end game right now because everyone else who's played it is under strict NDA, rip to them. Uh, he got a basically a few days of early time, Blizzard flew him out, he got to play an endgame build, they gave him an account that had one of each class, and these were at various stages of progression, ranging from levels 45 to 75, because remember, endgame basically starts as soon as you finish the campaign. So let's start off with uh, Capstone Dungeons. So after completing the campaign, this is like the final challenge to progress from one difficulty tier into the next. Specifically, there is a Capstone Dungeon as you move from World Tier 2 Veteran into World Tier 3 Night. Nightmare, and then another capstone dungeon going from world tiers 3 to 4, which is Nightmare to Torment, with Torment being the final uh, world tier difficulty that the game's gonna have at release. Now, these capstone dungeons, uh, Riker said, are significantly more difficult than Nightmare Dungeons and presented a real challenge. He tried the level 50 capstone dungeon with his level 35 rogue and said it was incredibly difficult. He kept on dying over and over again just to elite packs, and really he just couldn't complete it at first. So he he went back, he respect a few times, upgraded all of his gear, and then after a few tries was finally able to clear it. What's of note though is in the capstone dungeons there is a final boss which is meant to be sort of like a pinnacle challenge for each of the world tiers. It even had some one-shot mechanics which caused him a bit of trouble, but again after some finagling and changing things up he was able to clear it. He then went on to say that when he tried the world tier 3 capstone dungeon to progress to world tier 4, the experience was a whole lot smoother and that dungeon was was level 75 and the character he was playing was also level 75 so it does seem that if you are of the equivalent level the capstone dungeon should be a lot easier however even being of the same level he said that the boss fight was still quite difficult he had to learn the mechanics and really pay attention to avoid taking significant damage it was enough of a challenge going through these capstone dungeons were enough of a challenge that he would suggest the hardcore players actually try it on softcore first of course as you and I both know People who play it hardcore are lunatics. I say that in the most endearing way possible. They ain't gonna try softcore first. They're gonna be going as soon as the game launches, even with the servers dying constantly, these people are gonna be in there playing hardcore. But yeah, the main point was capstone dungeons are meant to present a real challenge. They are the blockade as you move up the world tiers. So after completing the first capstone dungeon and you progress from world tiers two to world tier three, which is nightmare difficulty, that is when more of the end game activities open up and he talked a bit about the Nightmare Dungeons and the Helltides. So starting with Nightmare Dungeons, we of course know that these are the hard mode version of dungeons. This is like one of the main end game activities. They require Nightmare Sigils that will boost the dungeon level while also adding affixes for both the monsters and the dungeon itself. Now Riker didn't actually expand upon this in the video, but we did see from the screenshot that he showcased a few examples of what these types of modifications can be. So for example, for monster affixes, we saw, saw stuff like the monsters can be enhanced with various types of elemental damage, they can have their attack speed increased, they can have their resistances increased, or they can gain the unstoppable buff, making them immune to crowd control. But then we also saw some of the names of the dungeon affixes. So one that we saw was called Nightmare Portal. This looks to be the portals that were described in a previous endgame video from Blizzard that will just periodically appear as you're going through a nightmare dungeon, summoning in new monsters from other locations in the world. We also saw affixes for something Thing called Storm Bane's Wrath. Now through some leaks, we did learn that there was a nightmare aff dungeon affix where lightning strikes would periodically come down that could potentially one-shot you. Uh, that could be what the Storm Bane's Wrath one is referring to. And there was also an affix for Blood Blister, and I'm just gonna make a guess here that this is something like random explosions of blood uh, uh, appear on the ground that you have to avoid. I don't know, maybe something like this. But it is really cool to see that the nightmare dungeons are not just enhancing the monsters, 
but also adding an additional mechanic layer on top of the dungeon experience. I love to see it. So the Nightmare Dungeons come with as well limited numbers of revives. And if you die too many times, you will then fail the dungeon, basically just losing your key and missing out on any rewards at the end. So it does seem like as you move higher up these sigil tiers, they allow fewer revives. And these do appear to be tied to the world tiers as well. And I, I'll tell you, as soon as you get to having being limited to just four revives, that's really going to make people need to pay attention. Now, they did something basically similar, similar to this in function in Diablo 3, where whenever you died, it would put you further and further behind the timer as you're trying to fill up the bar before the timer uh, expires so that you can get those bonus enhancements to your gems. They're doing something like this, but actually just having a hard fail state from it, or at least I'm assuming it's a hard fail state. Maybe that's not the case. I actually don't know if we've got clarification if the revive limitations are referring to bonuses that you can get if you go within those limits, or if it's just going to kick you out of the dungeon after you after you reach it. I am assuming the former, but I'm actually not certain at the moment. But either way, there are revive restrictions that are going to have some consequence tied to them. So from his experience, it looks like early on we will be getting nightmare sigils, which are like the keys to activate the nightmare dungeons, specifically from the Tree of Whispers, which is like the game's bounty system or quest system. You're also able to craft sigils. These are random, but basically after breaking sigils down, you're rewarded sigil powder. And then with that powder, you can craft a different difficulty tiers and it's going to give you a random dungeon sigil. You don't know exactly which one you're going to get, but you will get one within a range. Now, one interesting note that Riker mentioned here is that of the 100 plus dungeons that are going to be in the game at release, apparently only 30 of them will be eligible for the nightmare variations with every season. So in the first season, which is scheduled sometime shortly after launch, we're going to have 30 dungeons that can be upgraded to nightmare variants and then uh, 90 plus or something like that that can't be and they'll just always be normal dungeons. And then come season two, there will be a new list of 30 potential nightmare variants of the total 100 plus dungeons in the game. Now, I got to say, I am really surprised by this I, and I'm a bit baffled as to why exactly they're choosing to have a restriction and a limit of which dungeons can have nightmare dungeons in each season. My first thought was maybe they're doing this to prevent people from running the same most efficient dungeon over and over again. But then I realized that can't be the reason because we can't just hand pick which dungeon we're doing a nightmare vari variant of because we rely on whatever nightmare sigils we get and which ones we get are completely random. So it's a bit confusing as to why exactly they're choosing to do it this way. I'm, I'm really, I'm not sure what their justification is for wanting to limit. They're just basically taking the pool of potential variation of the end game in a season and cutting it by like a third, at least when it comes to the nightmare uh, dungeons in particular. There are, of course, other end game activities that we will be doing as well. But I'm not really, I'm, I'm a bit confused and I'd be interested to hear what their like philosophy is behind doing that restriction. It's, it seems odd to me. It seems not good, frankly. At least that's my gut reaction. Okay, so next up there are Helltides. As we know, Helltides will take a part of a zone and completely take it over, buffing the monsters within that region, adding new types of monsters, raining down fire, and then also providing a unique resource to farm for. Specifically, as we kill enemies within the Helltides, we are rewarded with cinders, and then those cinders can be cashed in at Helltide chest. And this is a great way to farm for specific pieces of gear, specific gear slots, because every Helltide chest will clearly show you exactly what type of gear is inside of it. So you can see if it's a helm, if it's a sword, if it's pants, whatever. Also in the Helltides will be roaming bosses. We've seen some examples of this in various uh, videos that have released, as well as what he called a unique boss that has its own unique chest. This is kind of like a spoiler territory. It's meant to be like a really, really difficult challenge, but if he can overcome it, apparently we'll have some awesome rewards. There are also going to be public events that are unique to the Helltides. These are varied from the typical event that were in that zone pre prior to the Helltide. And then one big thing that he confirmed, we heard about this from leaks from the endgame beta, but now we have like an official announcement of it, is the Helltides are going to be rotating one hour on one hour off. We did learn, I should mention, that at any given time, there will be two zones within all of the zones in the world that will have a hell tide taking place in them when it is toggled on. So you'll have, say, from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., there will be hell tides, two areas.
areas will have hell tides in them and then from eight to nine no hell tides and then from nine to ten hell tides are back into new areas now this time gating is pretty common in online live service games it's also what they're doing with the world bosses as well as the zone wide uh, zone public events all of this stuff is on a predetermined schedule now odds are there will be websites third-party sites out there that track the timers for this stuff because in game you're only given a heads up just prior to the event happening now design wise I assume their reason behind doing this is to stop people from farming these particular activities non-stop so that people can't just farm the world boss over and over or farm hell tides or farm the zone event it does really suck for people with limited play time like if you're one of those people who can only manage to hop in for 30 minutes or an hour at a time and you just happen to be playing when the world boss isn't active when the hell tide isn't active and those are things you want to do that really sucks I do think one possible remedy for this would be for them to have the bosses the hell tides and the public events constantly up but balance out the rewards that you get across activities or just limit them so that you can't you can't get the big rewards from each of these things but once every hour whether it's a particular resource a particular piece of gear a particular consumable whatever it is they're trying to limit players from a, 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 a amassing quickly by farming things over and over again they can put those restrictions on without completely eliminating those events and this will make it so that people who only have 30 minute windows can still do those things when they have those 30 minutes but then the people who are playing 12 hours a day no life in the game they will be paced out and they they can't just routinely farm over and over and over again i think that's a potential solution if that is the particular reason behind what they're doing here the paragon board i was actually really excited to hear him talk about this so he was talking about the fact that each board has a legendary node which we we knew that each particular board is basically built around that node and that the nodes themselves are essentially better versions of legendary aspects with a lot of different supporting nodes to play into that this is basically just like getting another piece of gear but then offering some customization within the path that you take and which particular powers you take and then you add the glyph system on top of that where you're going to be putting these glyphs in and then there's going to be a radius depending on the strength of the glyph the rarity of the glyph that even further boosts you up it, it just the paragon board system sounds a lot more interesting now after he described how it works and kind of how it functions at, towards player progression. Uh, just a couple other notes here from the video that I wanted to touch on. At one point mentioned that Blizzard told him there was no best experience farming activity. Like when it comes to all the things you can do in endgame, everything is going to reward equal experience. Of course, as we know, that is never the case. The player base will find which activity gives the best experience per hour, even if it is just like five to 10% better better than anything else and that will be then considered the ideal method of experience farming just like in Diablo 3 you had like the the chest farming trying to get the bonus chest and the massacre bonus runs that you would do there will be something that's even if it's just slightly better than everything else that players will figure out we're going to find the efficiency because that's what we do so that is a bit of a recap as well as expanding upon certain things although i do suggest checking out Riker's video if you want to hear it straight from the source oddly enough though he didn't really touch on a few major end game systems like he didn't talk at all about world boss farming maybe they didn't want him to spoil the world bosses in the other zones who knows he didn't touch on fields of hatred at all and he barely talked about tree of whispers other than to say that's how you get your first nightmare sigils although i guess there's really not much to say about tree of whispers because it is just a bounty quest system but i'm i wanted to hear more about world bosses and i definitely wanted to hear about the pvp the fields of hatred so i am hopeful that he makes a follow-up video talking and diving into some of the stuff as well so long as blizzard isn't preventing him from doing so or maybe the build that he played didn't have it in it uh didn't have those things or he just didn't spend his time focused on those things who knows a anyways let's move on to the next story but first a word from today's sponsor Ridge Wallet. By now, you most certainly know them. They've been sponsoring our videos for quite some time here on the channel. It's a product that I use every single day of the week, and I like it. They are durable, built-to-last wallets that are pretty much just aimed at keeping your pockets light. They got a slim profile, carry around what you need. It's a nice and simple proposition. Ridge Wallets are made out of durable materials and come with a lifetime warranty, as well as a 45-day risk-free trial. They can hold up to 12 cards, plus have room for cash on the back, thanks to the 
this little handy strap. It's made out of RFID blocking tech to protect you from digital pickpocketers, and they're offered in over 30 different colors and styles. My personal favorites include things like carbon fiber and gunmetal. If you haven't already and you're interested in checking out Ridge, go ahead and use my link in the description below or head on over to ridge.com force. Using code force at any time will get you a 10% discount on any purchase. In an interview with WCCF Tech, lead class designer of Diablo 4, Adam Jackson, waded into the respec cost debate discussing Blizzard's current philosophy on this particular issue. He said, our vision for respec is that we have to balance this idea that we want players to commit to a fantasy and a character and have actual weight and meaning to their choices, but we also want them to feel free to customize their character and explore and try different builds and fantasies and ways to play. Where we've landed on that is that earlier in the game, it is very cheap, basically to the point that it's essentially free to respec your character and change around your build and experiment what you do. And then when you get to the really late game, we do want you to start to optimize and focus on a build and focus on a real fantasy so you have that identity of I am a werewolf druid or I am a bloodcasting magic necro. They keep talking about this fantasy stuff and I just gotta tell you, I just really couldn't care less. I'm not interested in the fantasy of my my spec and my build. I'm more into the fantasy of my class and my class has all of these different possibilities and I really would just love to have reasonable access to all of those possibilities and not be restricted because they want me to have a build fantasy that you know, let's be honest here, a build fantasy that's just tied to whichever gear that I happen to get dropped. And then when I get a new piece of gear drop, oh, I've got a new fantasy. I've got a new fantasy now. And now I want to go towards that fantasy. So I got a farm for however many hours. Although I don't want to lean into that too hard right now because we don't know how many hours. And that's something that really isn't likely to be settled until release. A couple other quotes here. Uh, last bit was he said, as far as the idea of making everything free forever, I don't think that we're going to be going down that direction anytime soon. But this is a live service game and we are going to continue to listen to feedback from the community. And honestly, our goal over time is to make the best game possible. So whatever that we feel, best players, yada, yada, yada. When it comes to the respect stuff, I think too expensive is just generally bad. I, I feel like they need to make sure they don't make it so prohibitive that someone feels the pressure to re-roll a character just because they find a new item that makes them want to try out a new build. Because honestly, who's got like, who's got time for that? Come on, let's be honest. Well, maybe we do. We're, we're a RPG players after all and MMO players after all so we got plenty of time to game but and beyond the excuse of class fantasy I assume one of the big reasons why they want to put limitations on respecking, and I think this is understandable is to stop people from constantly changing specs for various activities so that like they got a spec for nightmare dungeons and then they got a spec for world bosses and then they got a spec for pvp and every time they go between focusing on those they feel the desire to change up their spec completely which as we know will take a, a bunch of time unless of course they do templates and maybe that is an answer as well. If they want to keep these restrictions where we're not constantly swapping things around, it would be great if they had like loadouts, right? So give us like two loadouts. Maybe I can have a PVP loadout and a PVE loadout because uh, I don't want to have to roll another class, especially as we know how long it's supposed to take, how many hundreds of hours it's supposed to take for those classes to eventually reach max level and max out their Paragon board. And it's a big time investment. And at least I know personally, I will probably be sticking to one class a season and just focusing on progressing them as far as possible. And something else I do want to add here and to consider is that one of the unintended consequences I feel like of having these overly restrictive respecs is that it puts pressure on players and at least some portion of the players to really not mess things up or in other words, just to copy meta builds. You have a bad build and then because you have that bad build, you're punished because it's going to take longer to get the gold that you need to respec out of that bad build, right? And I feel like that's a process that at least for some players, especially players who are limited on time, will only go through once or twice before they just end up uh, going online and copying builds from various sites. And you know, I know there's a whole, uh, there's a whole portion of the player base out there who say I would never copy a build and that's just you're not really playing the game. I like playing the game because I like physically playing the game. The part of the game that I, I don't care so much about is spending hours trial and erroring things and trying different things to see if they work and then if they don't work going back and spending hours trying different things to see if they work i'd rather just have someone else who spent those 10 20 100 hours figuring out which build is ideal for whatever particular activity or for a well-rounded build or for whatever my goals are and use the time that they sent like a vampire sucking the time out of them <laughs> and using it for my own benefit and just get to play the game and do the part that i like which is clicking and moving around and seeing the stuff but not just some people are into it and I think that's great for those that are, but many people aren't and they just want something that's gonna make them 
feel like they are uh, they have a competent build and they can do things and not feel like they are hamper they're they're like self hamstringing themselves by trying something on their own and then being restricted. But again, I do need to emphasize that we have no idea how much gold it's going to end up costing or how long it'll take for the average player to accumulate just by playing normally. I just think it's a fun discussion to have around the design philosophy of respecking and the prohibitive nature of it or not prohibitive. Where it's going to end up landing, we will not know until release. I know people are like dissecting the amount shown for respects on various videos and streams. But there's a decent chance that this could or already has changed before that final 1.0 patch and launch. So we'll just have to see where it ends up settling. We got an update this week on hardcore PVP and it's going to be hardcore. Hardcore mode, of course, refers to the variation of these games where if your character dies for whatever reason, it's done. It is dead for good, deleted, see you later, out of there. Now Blizzard has confirmed that this will apply to the game's PVP as well. So if you go into Fields of Hatred with a hardcore character, your character dies in that PVP arena to another player, it's dead because you're playing hardcore. Maybe it doesn't seem like a surprise, but there was some consideration that maybe they would make it so that you could freely PVP and then the hardcore element would only be attached to PVE. And there was also precedence for this thought because a few years back in an interview with Mr. Llama SC, Blizzard did state that PVP deaths in hardcore would not result in permanent death. Clearly that has changed. In general, I'm okay with this, at least in theory, because it's hardcore. Hardcore players are there for the hardcore experience, but I do think in practicality, the concern concern here is that what it ends up just meaning is very few people ever step into fields of hatred in hardcore, not just because they could die by getting player killed by someone else, but then you've got things like server issues and glitches and hackers, which let's be honest, there are hackers in just about every major game. There are going to be hackers in Diablo 4. It's almost, just, there, there will be hackers. Dying to that would be abysmal. And it just seems like the risk will far outweigh the reward because of that, especially as players have more and more time invested into their hardcore characters. I think early on, it's not so much of a big deal. In fact, to that point, I would love like low level hardcore PvP. I, that sounds amazing to me. I do wonder if Blizzard could do something like bucket players into certain level ranges. So maybe they make it so that they could do like level ranges of 10 as you're working your way up to max level and they could just bucket players together. So players from 10 to 19 will all play and only show up in their particular instances in the fields of hatred and then players 20 to 29, 30 to 39, etc., etc. Sort of like how World of Warcraft does their battlegrounds. That would stop people from dealing with high level characters over geared characters people just way more powerful than them. Now, it's not going to address the concern of uh, glitches, bugs, and hackers killing them in PvP. You know, it is hardcore, so the whole point is high stakes, but I think that balance could be really fun. I know I would do it. Like, I would totally love, like, a level 19 twink PvP uh, hardcore battles. Like, I think that would be a lot of fun. I really do, and that's something that I would personally engage with. But if I'm playing hardcore and I have 100 hours in my character, I ain't stepping in the fields of hatred. There's just way too much that could go wrong besides me just getting owned because someone's better than me. But there's just too many other potential issues that would just be infuriating beyond belief. I think another middle ground too, something that uh, Liam and I were talking about was what if they just made it so that a hardcore death moves your character into softcore? I think that's a potential answer. It seems like that could be a reasonable uh, solution for people who want to try hardcore PVP, but not just have their character deleted. Uh, campaign. So we got confirmation that the campaign will be roughly 35 hours in total, probably closer to 30 to 25 if you're skipping all the cutscenes, like this weirdo here. And that's going to put you around level 45 to 50 as we touched on with Riker. He's, his character finished the campaign at level 45 and then he did the level 50 capstone dungeon. But they did also say that reaching the max character level of 100 is supposedly going to be taking around 150 hours. So quite a significant amount of time and probably something that not most people are going to get within every season. It seems like that level 100 character level is going to be like, that's, I mean, that's a big milestone to hit 150 hours it is over the course of three months that's still a lot of hours that's a lot of hours to have to sink in every day and every week for most people who don't just game for a living or who just don't do anything but game and <laughs> don't do much else uh, in their free time so but it is kind of cool here we'll have to see if that 150 hour mark is a true estimate or if the various farming methods the xp farming that the player base will certainly find cuts that in half potentially i mean i honestly if i know gamers and i do you know, I've been one my whole life. When the developer says something takes 150 hours, 
they're talking about like developer pace, right? They're talking about like casual player pace. When the hardcore dudes step in, 50, 60 hours. <laughs> I'm just throwing out random guesses here. Who knows? But man, we just, we, we, you can just find just the, the most egregious like XP farming exploits. We will. Don't you worry, we will. It's worth noting as well too, It do that doesn't mean 150 hours till end game. You start end game as soon as you finish the campaign basically. It's just the max character level is said to take around 150 hours. Uh, there was some confusion this past week about when mounts unlock. Initially, there were sites reporting that this happened after completing the campaign. That is not the case. It has been cleared up. They were actually gonna unlock mounts fairly early on. It seems like uh, somewhere around act two after completing a specific quest line. So we're gonna have mounts um, uh, pretty early on in the process, which love to see it, especially in this big open world. A couple other things, there were some official Blizzard videos, like they had the inside the game, your class, your way video. This was a super basic overview of class customization. They talked about like builds and progression. Nothing really significant here with the exception of about around the three minute mark, specifically at 254 in the video, we saw a little glimpse of skip campaign. Um, and it has been confirmed that this is a feature. After you um, complete the campaign the first time, you will unlock the ability to skip it on any future character. And I do believe it was was also confirmed that this will apply to seasons as well. So leading up to the first season, you finish the campaign. Then once you go into the season number one, you don't have to play through the story campaign again. And you'll just basically be leveling in D4's version of adventure mode where you'll go out and you'll do whatever activities you want for resources, for fast experience farming, for, for whatever, just whatever you feel like doing basically. They also just today released a gameplay guide uh, focused on monsters, world bosses, and mounts. In it, we saw them cover the various monster families, that's just like the type of enemies. They also touched on the elite affixes, which was kind of cool, breaking down cold, fire, lightning, poison, shadow, and utility. They talked about the special monsters, which are the rare spawns. They also briefly touched on world bosses, real basic stuff, just talking about how it's new to the Diablo franchise. The camera zooms back. They got health bar breakpoints for various phases and the stagger bar. They talked about the treasure goblin. It was real simple, like most of these like PR marketed official Diablo videos are. Riker's video was far the far more interesting video that came out this week. They also released a couple new class trailers, which was pretty basic stuff as well. And then the final big thing, of course, that's happened over the course this past week is we learned that there's going to be another beta taking place. Uh, they're calling this the server slam beta. So expect things to not function properly. It's going to be running from May the 12th to the 14th. We're going to have all five classes available. They changed it from a level 25 cap to level 20, which seems odd. And it's going to have all the other same content as the last beta. We're playing through Fractured Peaks. They're going to have the Ashafa world boss, although thankfully he will be spawning much more frequently than he did in the last last test. And there's going to be a new cosmetic reward for defeating a Shava at level 20. So even if you played the last beta, there is a new reward. So if you want to get that, be sure to hop in and check it out. And that pretty much does it. That is a recap of uh, most of the major news that we had come out over the past like seven days or so. I'll probably keep on doing this here on the main channel. And uh, we have covered some of the other updates that have happened over the past few weeks. I know there hasn't been much D4 discussion here on this channel. Check out our other channel if you're interested in uh, uh, getting some of the more nitty gritty stuff there. But going forward, I will still be doing a lot more D4 here as well. So stay tuned for that. But that does it for this video. Thank you as always for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.